Hello, good afternoon. We are going to open this um, series of, of uh, roundtables and this one will be dedicated to economy and, and taxes. And with the session we initiate, we are going to end with this series of roundtables. It was four with today's session and they had to do with important topics such as biodiversity, um, energy transition and the agri-food system. All of them have to do with a key uh, plan for ecology transition of the economy um, and the society. We are doing this series of, uh, of talks for the green transition for Europe at a time when we have a sanitary crisis that has no equal in the it's a unique moment in our story this is a global health crisis that is showing that we can't when uh, crises are global uh, we um, find ourselves before huge hurdles and we require the collaboration of all the institutions all the countries national as well as international to be able to face the consequences of, of such a crisis, of a crisis such as this one that we are facing, the COVID crisis. And it also shows that, that the COVID crisis it overlaps on top of crisis of the um, environmental crisis and climate crisis that the world suffers from. And as the whole international community shows the relationship between health crisis and environmental crisis, climate crisis. So we believe that the fact that we finish this cycle of uh, roundtables on green transition for Europe with a roundtable dedicated to economy and taxes is very much relevant because obviously an ecological transition for the economy and the society requires economy policies and tax policies that are consistent and that make it possible. And in that sense, we thought that it was very much needed to end with this topic in a series of roundtables, of four roundtables, so that we could largely and um, at ease debate on the changes that we require that are seminal in order to be able to initiate our journey in this transition towards an economy that is really sustainable, that is really green. And we are doing this at a time when we know that the EU has for the first time given a united answer, a strong um, answer when facing a general crisis, a health crisis in this case, that is very different to the response that they, that they had in 2008 with the financial crisis and that showed that other political, other economic crises could be faced in such a way so that we can really tackle this crisis. So we need to have an answer, a response, an economic response, but not just an economic response, also a monetary and tax respond and, uh, response. And for the first time, the EU has set up an economic response by um, uniting our debt with economic instruments, financial instruments and tax instruments that are EU instruments. An answer that shows that if Europe stands stronger, it is easier to face these crises. And an economic answer or a response of such a dimension, of such a huge dimension in the sense that um, huge amounts of funds are going to be destined by the EU to respond to this crisis obviously is an extraordinary opportunity so that these resources are destined to fighting against climate change in a deeper way and tackling green transition for our economy. These are challenges that the EU already had but now we have a unique opportunity, a huge opportunity to accelerate this, to really tackle this in a decided manner with many more economic resources than we previously had or that we could previously have had in the case of Spain in a clear and obvious way. Because if something has been seen thanks to the COVID crisis is the fact that there is no economy without health, 
and also what is clear, what is obvious, and every every institution, every international institution says so, and the science says so, and political um, political figures also say that there will not be economy without ecology. So to talk about this and to talk about the response that Europe is giving to this and the resources that are going to be destined with their next generation program and with the um, budgets that we have in the, the budgets for the EU, we currently have two extraordinary speakers who have had, have had the generosity of being here with us and we think that we are closing this session of roundtables at the highest level. And first of all, we will give the floor to Natalia Fabra, who is professor from the Department of Economy of the Carlos III University in Madrid. She is a member of the Consultant uh, Committee for Economic Affairs in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation. In 2014, she was awarded with the Sabadella Herrero Prize for her research in the field of industrial economy and with the Julian Marias Award for her research in social sciences. Natalia has been an associate researcher at the Center of Economy and Policy Research and she is an editor of the Journal of Industrial Economics. She is also a publisher of the New York Economic Papers and she is also a member of Economistas Frente a la Crisis. She is a colleague of mine because I'm also a member of Economistas Frente a la Crisis and she is one of the best experts in economy for energy. So it is really a pleasure and to have her here today and it is a luxury to have her here. The second speaker will be Ernesto Urtasun, an economist, a diplomat and a politician. He comes from Barcelona. He is a European MP. He was uh, in 2014 a member of uh, Izquierda Plural and now he is Catalonian Comun integrated in the Green Group. As a diplomat he has different responsibilities at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. He currently is one of the vice presidents of the Green Group of the European Parliament and he is a member of the Commission of the European Parliament for Economic Reconstruction. So he is the person who is at the lab where uh, this fund is being designed and where the regulations for the fund are being designed as well. So they are setting the conditions under which this fund will be managed and used by the different countries. So as I was saying, the EU has set up economic resources that are unique for countries who were most impacted by COVID. Spain is one of those countries. We will have around 140 million euros from the EU for these next years. Part of that uh, money will be alone, but another part will not be alone. And we will have the possibility of having a very important number of, uh, well, a very important amount of money so that we can also accelerate the plans that our country had for the fight against climate change and for ecologic transition um, of our economy for the generation of green jobs. And as I was saying, it is a great opportunity and if we were not to use it as we should, it would be a, a great pity and it would be uh, a stone over our heads that would be a hurdle in our progress in our development in the next decades if we are not to profit from this benefit from this um, opportunity for the ecologic trans transformation of the economy and with no further ado we will start this session since the previous sessions the speaker um, speakers had the possibility of doing their um, a presentation a 15 minute intervention we will do that this time as well all the participants can use the chat so that they can write down their questions to whatever topics they wish to to ask on and we will send those questions to the speakers and after this first intervention we will have um, interventions from the different speakers answering the questions and um, talking in depth about the different topics that have not been dealt with. And with no further ado, I would like to thank uh, the people who are connected 
to the session. I would like to thank the Foundation Transición Verde and La Casa Encendida for organizing this, this series of roundtables. And I will now just um, give the floor to our first speaker, to Natalia Fabra. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando. And I would like to thank the, the rest of organizers for organizing this session, um, this interesting conversation amongst all, all of us present here today. So during this first intervention, I wanted, first of all, to uh, talk about the state of the crisis here in Spain, the status of the crisis here in Spain, and then talk about some matters that have to do with the opportunity that the recovery fund is offering us and the measures that I believe should be taken into account so that we can really benefit from all the potential of this recovery fund as a lever for the transformation of the country in general. I'm saying this from an economic point of view, but also from a social point of view. It's been, uh, it's been two years of a systemic crisis, of an enormous depth. Actually, there are no precedents to this crisis. We are in a context of, of great uncertainty. We are at the peak of a second wave. We don't have any certainty of the economic implications and social implications that this could have. As a matter of fact, this could also have political implications and we don't know where the end of this crisis lies. I believe that if, if we, if we um, have some power um, in, in this crisis is the fact that we have learned. We have learned that austerity measures will not get us out of this crisis, but on the contrary, would dig our grave deeper. This crisis would be even more serious and would have horrible consequences, not just on the economy, but also with regards to inequalities inequalities in the distribution of revenue and wealth and also inequality in education and in, this, in the health of our citizens and also everything that has to do with gender inequality. So I think that we have gotten to this crisis having learned the lessons, knowing what we do not want to repeat. And in my opinion, I believe that there is consensus, consensus that I hope will last with regards to really the convenience of setting up economies, uh, policies that will stimulate the economy instead of smothering it like uh, we did in 2008. Spain quite possibly is one of the countries that is most affected by the economic crisis, not just due to the intensity with which the pandemic has, has hit us, but also due to our sectorial composition because we are really dependent on the services sector and the tourism sector that for obvious reasons has been very much impacted by this pandemic. During the second wave, the expectations, I believe, are uh, getting worse and this could have very serious consequences on cons consumption and investment and even on the destruction of jobs. So I believe that measures are needed, measures that will not just contribute to maintaining uh, salaries, uh, such as the policies that have been implemented with quite some success up till now, where all the job regulation schemes and um, um, loans to, uh, to production that the ICO has set up, but also other policies that could reactivate the economy. And the recovery fund that everyone is, is talking about and that everyone is so hopeful um, for is not going to have this role. The recovery fund that I will talk about now is going to be a unique opportunity for us to transform our economy, but in order to transform our economy in the mid to long term, not to reactivate our economy now. It's not the stimulus that we need right now to reactivate our economy presently. The funds, the resources that come from the recovery fund will get here during the next year and regardless of whether we approve the budgets or not, uh, those resources might be put in circulation in the economy. We are talking about funds that are going to be invested, that are going to be spent all through a six-year period. So it's um, a period that will um, go beyond the recessive cycle that we are currently living. And it has a series of conditions 
In this case, these are conditions that are very different to the conditions that we were used to in 2008. This is a positive, con positive conditions. It has to do with where we're going to be using those pumps, but these conditions are going to, to, um, going to be compromised because these funds can be understood as, um, as a plan that is not a plan for the stimulus of demand. And if it is not a plan for the stimulus of demand, we will have to set up other measures that are capable to re-stimulate consumption and stimulate investment and also strengthen our capacity to, um, to, inc to, to be able to get taxes so that we can finance those additional measures to sustain uh, people's income. So this is the reactivation that I am referring to all through this conversation. And especially um, after having, um, when we have seen the proposals of budgets, we will be able to see how, how the state needs to be able to, to reinforce its capacity to collect taxes. So uh, what I want to say during these first words is that if the recovery fund is not a plan to stimulate uh, demand, what is it? Well, this, the recovery fund is actually a lever, a lever for the change of our production model and our social model in our country. If we manage to, to benefit from this potential in six years, we will find a completely different country to the one that we currently know a country that could have completely transformed itself as it did when using the European funds at the end of the, the, the 80s and beginning of the 90s. The government has established four um, axes for a green Spain, a digital Spain, a Spain with no gender issues, a, a Spain that is inclusive. Those four pillars are the ones that we will that will be the basis of the policies that we will set up with the recovery fund. I believe that not only will it allow for a change of the productive model, but it will also be a source for productivity in this country. We will be able to uh, work on policies on the energy sector, deployment of renewable energies together with the deployment of, of uh, storage assets that will allow us to access if we do it well, if our reforms um, are the right ones, will allow us to access um, consumption and an electrical supply at a lower cost which will have an impact on the productivity of companies because for many of them electricity energy input has a very big weight in their cost structures and also uh, with regards to the income of companies revenues of companies because you know that um, um, energy is one of the main vectors for the decarbonization of the economy so this will have an impact on the success of this of this um, strategy for electrification and not only with the reduction of an energy cost but also through the digitization and the improvement of our mobility, the improvement of uh, services that will be provided thanks to digitization um, by, uh, by the administration, services provided by the administration. So this is a project to change our country that will provide us with economic benefits, with social benefits as well. And many of the people present here today have been fighting for ecologic transition as a change lever, as a package of policies that could reactivate the economy, generate jobs, quality jobs and creating um, an industrial and entrepreneurial fabric. So it is a great satisfaction to us to see that thanks to the EU, in line with the policies that they were setting up, that the government was setting up here in Spain, ecologic transition is now at the first line of uh, policies that we are betting on. So there was a time when we were talking, when we were talking about picking winners as something that was actually frowned upon. But now we have modified this and we have changed that term for the uh, mission-oriented policies. I think that it is a great satisfaction that we do not feel um, ashamed when saying that policies and politicians should prioritize certain measures and not others 
and that that lesson and that decision should not be taken by the market but rather by politicians because we know that sometimes the market fails with regards to ecologic transition because private sector does not internalize all the social and economic benefits that come with ecologic transition so so welcome these resources, I welcome these opportunities and I welcome this change in discourse and narrative because in the end it conditions the policies that are set up. The recovery plan are not just resources, they're resources and reforms. I want to highlight here the complementarity between resources and reforms because it's not about just investing or about reforming but rather investing by reforming, because reforming without resources would not have an impact and resources invested without reforms that will last longer would have a very limited effects. So once again, I think that the example of renewable energy, since we're talking about a green transition, provides us with an example that really shows how complementary the need for, for reforms as well as investments is. We have been working to decarbonize our electrical sectors and for that we have to massively invest in renewable energies. As the uh, weight of renewable energies grows and the electrical mix and its marginal cost is very low, the prices of electricity go down. And these investments, if they are um, being paid for only through the prices of the market, there will get a point when they will not have enough profitability, they will not have a perspective for future income that will justify those investments to be put in place. So the resources might exist and there might be a wish by the entrepreneurial fabric to do it, but if the regulation does not recognize the nature of the technology, in this case uh, renewable energies, then those investments will not take place. So it is necessary to have those objectives and those resources with a regulatory reform. And how? Well, by the use, for instance, of, uh, of tenders or uh, the, such as the ones that we will have with the change of climate change. Uh, because if we have these auctions, if we have these auctions that will take place during the moment of investment, the prices that will result from that auction will set the average price of those investments and not the marginal price uh, of the product itself. So we need to have objectives, resources and reforms going hand in hand because in many fields, in many aspects, without, without that, those three axes, without those reforms, then the objectives will not be met. So I think that the script is written. It is a script that has actually uh, music that I like. And now we need to to film. We need to make this film. And when we make this film, I know that we'll get the Oscar. We already have the resources that have been allocated for Spain. We now have to give them the best use possible. We have to give those resources the best um, use possible. Those those transfers, those mm, transfers mainly. And I think that this is where most, most of the key, li uh, key of the matter lies. How are we going to allocate those resources so that we manage to, to put in place projects that are transformative projects with the capacity of uh, creating new jobs and creating industrial fabric and to do it at the lowest cost possible because that way instead of doing 10 projects we'll be able to have 20 projects and it, that will depend on how we design those mechanisms. We are in a context where there is a very serious problem of asymmetric information. The regulator or in this case the government has to assign those funds and obviously they do not know all the details that have to do with the projects for instance what will be the amount, what will be the cost of each of those projects and to what extent are these projects that will give some added value, so projects that, that could not be done without these funds. Well, in practice, in the practice of regulation, for instance, the regulation of public services, there are experiences on how to deal with these funds, how to allocate funds and how to set prices 
uh, when there is asymmetric information. And I think that we have a lot to learn from those practices. We need to use auctions, we need to use uh, tariffs per uh, threshold. This could be set up uh, with quite success to select amongst all the uh, companies that are willing to do a project, those that could do it in the best way possible and with a lesser cost. And this will obviously depend on the project because there will be uh, cases where only one company can develop one project, so we have to think of other mechanisms that are not competitive mechanisms for this to happen. I think that transparency and clarity when setting up these uh, mechanisms, those criteria for allocation are basic so that we can avoid something that worries me, which is trying to find an income. The government has to spend a certain amount of resources and there will be a long queue of companies uh, looking forward to spending that money. But we want for those resources to be spent in an efficient way and not through um, revisiting activities. So, Asymmetric information is very important and it refers to the aspect of additionality. We don't want for those resources to be used to finance projects that would have done, have been uh, put in place in any other circumstance. We don't want a crowding out effect. We don't want to replace private resources with public resources. And we also want for allocation mechanisms to be able to understand if this additionality effect exists or not. There is a matter that also worries me with regards to how those funds are going to be allocated and it has to do with the market structure. We are going to be financing projects for future activities and I wouldn't want for those funds to be used to provide resources to the same, the usual suspects because we would be consolidating their dominance in the market. There are companies that nowadays might not exist but that would exist if they were to receive those funds or companies that are small enough to be able to set up the um, application for those resources. So it would be good for us to think of a mechanism that would allow to give money from those funds to startups and to um, companies that are, that are very dynamic and that could allow us to deconcentrate the structure of the market or at least to not have an impact on that concentration of the market. And there is another topic and I will not um, take more of your time so that Ernest also can take the floor because I'm sure that he will be telling us very interesting things and more specific details about the topics that I am tackling here. There is something that worries me which is the public return of those investments beyond the dynamizing effects that they could have on the economy. For instance, I can think if we have decided that through these funds we're going to be financing the deployment of the um, optic fiber um, networks in the cities and Telefonica was the company that was in charge of doing this investment through these uh, tender processes we have understood that for this project to be able to, to be put in place then Telefonica needed at least 10% of the total amount of the project, then I understand that what would be fair uh, would be that if the state is paying for 10% of that project, then, then uh, the state should be uh, the owner of 10% of that project. And it could be done by a joint venture between the state and the company Telefonica, which I understand that Ernest, I, I, could tell me that this could be compatible with the current framework of, um, of subsidies, state subsidies. So all of us as taxpayers, because the European funds also come from our taxes, would benefit from, from this situation. We would benefit from the capital of those projects and it would um, value something that has been forgotten, which is the value of the public sector and entrepreneurial sector. And finally, because I don't want to take more time, I would like to just throw on the table um, a topic that we could maybe tackle. It seems to be a unique opportunity to add value to something that had lost some value, which is the value of industrial policies. We want these investments to take place. We want to plant windmills and solar plants in our fields. We want for them to generate electricity free from emission, but we also want in that process 
for industry to be used. We want industry that could generate jobs and entrepreneurial fabric in our country. So, so without falling in the trap of protectionism, I do think that we have to use it as an opportunity to to show the value of the policies that allow for an industrial sector to also participate in this process. And that mm, will be my final uh, contribution so that Ernest can take the floor. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Natalia. And well, you have said very interesting things and it couldn't be any other way. The recovery fund as an extraordinary level a lever that would change our, our model for green reindustrialization, a new way of producing and a new way of consuming as well. The ecological transition is of the first division of politics and we now have actually made it and we are in all the debates and even the recovery fund um, mainly talks about uh, the ecologic transition as well as digitalization and the funds have to fight for that. And you said something else that was also very important, and we have to be vigilant so that it's not companies, that's the usual suspects that are doing what they always do, and they're getting the same funds by greenwashing themselves, and we have lots of experiences in, in greenwashing. We have seen it in many activities that are not green, but they greenwash themselves, and now that we have that experience, we have to be vigilant so that we will not finance that which was going to be done either way, but this is a new way for them to finance their projects uh, uh, and that would also be a pity, we would be losing resources if that were to happen. So we have touched the very interesting topics and you have said something that I think is, um, is seminal. In parallel to this recovery fund, which are resources, we need reforms. And I remember that in Spain and maybe in Europe, there are some reforms that should take place in the parliament, such as the climate change law, the whole circular economy package and waste law. There is a whole package of mobility. In Europe, we have the, uh, the, uh, the common agricultural policy. We know that, the, that this common policy is not going in the right direction. It is not promoting an ecologic uh, transition in our way of producing food. And, and it's not enough to just have resources, we also have to do reforms and those are the two complementary elements. Okay, so with no further ado, I will give the floor to Ernesto Rutasun. Thank you very much, Natalia. And we will continue with our debate and digging deeper on all the matters that you have put on the table. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you, Natalia. It is a real pleasure to be here with all of you. These are days of, uh, of heated debate, debates about the recovery fund and the economic crisis that we are facing. And it is a pleasure because we always learn a lot during these roundtables and especially with interventions such as the one that Natalia has just made because she has really placed very well the challenges that we have, especially with regards to the transformation of the productive model in Spain and where we're headed. I really think that we still have to think about this. There is, we need more reflection about this. And I loved your intervention because you touched upon some important elements. And I will complement it with my European vision and how the negotiation of the fund is, is going on. And the European response or how this European response is, is being given, especially compared to the, the response in the previous crisis. Maybe we should start from them. I think that in the previous crisis, the states basically were getting out of, of a very harsh economic crisis and they had a, an enormous uh, cash flow crisis due to the design that the European Central Bank has designed that was completely chaotic. And this is a battle that we have been fighting since 2010, 2011 until now. With the, with the Bundesbank who did not want to modify the policy and all the countries pushing towards another direction. And it is a battle that we have won and we think, I think we need to say that. Um, nowadays, Spain could present the budget that um, it presented the other day with a very high deficit because the European Central Bank is buying debt in the secondary markets and is maintaining our emission of debt at a very reduced cost. And that is currently, I would like, I would say that that is the main safety bu buffer that we have in this crisis. 
Um, and there are obviously problems linked to, to that program and also to the purchase of corporate bonds that we have been that we have been um, talking about in the Parliament, in the European Parliament, how this could help or not help the, the ecological transition. But I wanted to say this because I think it is an important part of the response that we are giving to this pandemic. Regardless of this, the response that member states are giving to the EU and um, despite the uh, buffer that we have, the response is quite asymmetric. The level of public expenditure in different countries is completely uh, different. Germany and France, for instance. Well, Germany, well, I don't have the updated figures, but a few months ago, um, Germany had actually put 50% of the resources of the whole Eurozone to answer to this pandemic. And that is creating some distortions, competitive distortions in the internal European market. And, and Spain has a problem and we have to see how we can face that because obviously if our partners, if our neighbors are investing more money and they intervene their com companies more than ours, that is going to affect the competitiveness of many of our companies in this internal market. And this was a problem I wanted to mention because I think that the recovery fund um, and is actually a, an, a, our, our way of trying to balance the situation and fighting against that unbalance. Obviously, we're not going to have the same tax response in all countries because, as Natalia said, this is not a fund thought as a counter-cyclic uh, fund, although it will have counter-cyclic effects but rather thinking about the transition of the productive model. But nevertheless, it is a very important instrument. And if we take this whole package, I usually say that the EU well, has changed its consensus since the uh, economic crisis. It has gone from very neoliberal linked to the Troika to positions that are a bit more rational, more social democrat, that take us to a better answer, although it's still not perfect, with a more expansive monetary union, including the debt markets, and with the will willingness of developing tax mechanisms at the EU. So in July, we saw the birth of the recovery fund. And I think that what we have created, it's important, but what we have created are the bonds. Uh, for a very long time we talked about eurobonds and we finally have created federal debt. It did exist, but not at this volume. We are now going to issue 750 billion euros in debt that will be transferred to the countries directly. For the first time, these community instruments are not for loans, uh, with conditions, with, with all the limits that they had, but rather to make transfers. And this is the, the big news of the July agreement. Now, obviously, we now need for that, that money to be well used and in the right trend and direction, but mainly we mustn't uh, misspend that money and that's one of the fights that we currently have and I will explain that to you. We mustn't misspend that money by um, empowering the fossil fuel sector because that is one of the debates that we are currently having in the European Parliament and some people want to use that money to keep on investing in gas and 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 the uh, fair transition of coal and they're making it so long that it's no longer a transition but well that is the debate that we're currently having in the European Parliament about this fund. So just to set the context with regards to roadmap and the decision mechanism because nobody knows really what it is that we're discussing in the Parliament with regards to July. Well in July the member states agreed upon the instrument but then that instrument has to be developed in different regulations because it's not just one instrument, it's different instruments. So there is one instrument, which is the mobilization of private investment, which is an extension of the uh, Juncker plan. Then we have another instrument, which is called just transition mechanism for the uh, transition of polluting energies. Then there is another instrument called technical assistance facilities to help member states to absorb the funds, and that's important as well. Then there was another instrument that we really liked, which was something called solvency support instrument, which was to help from Europe to the solvency of SMEs, which is an important challenge that we also have here in Spain. That has um, that has failed because the council uh, killed it, and then we have the RRF, which is the Recovery Resilience Facility, which is the one that is going to channel 80% of the investments, and that is the regulation of the fund. 
let's call it um, that. And that is a regulation, a European regulation. It has uh, the, it is like a law within the legal European legal system, and we are now doing a co-decision process. So the Parliament and the Council co-decide about this regulation. So with the idea, because the Council has already voted on it, and tomorrow I think we will uh, vote on the Parliament's decision and position with regards to trilogues. You know that in legislative procedures in Europe, when we have Parliament, Council and Commission, we have to be in agreement with the idea that the regulation will be enforced on January 1st, so that on February 1st, the funds will get there. Uh, we have some delays, that's unavoidable, but it's not uh, dramatic because that first period, those 27 billion euros that should get to Spain, that the um, government has already included in its budgets. The mechanism to channel those funds is for the government to simply write a provision of, of expenses and income, where they include those 27 billion, the government puts that money forth and then they recover that money as they fulfill the uh, targets of the plan that they present. And I'm saying it because some people will say, oh, will not, the money will not be here on February 1st or in July or in September. Yes, but, the, but Spain can start spending because Sp Spain is putting that money forth and then will recover it later on. But that, that, is the, that is the schedule we're working with. So what do we have on the table as um, star topics of the debate? Well, first of all, I'll start with the Green, because since it is something that you have organized with the support of the Greens European Foundation, let's talk about the Green side of things. First of all, we wanted to increase the climate objectives up to 40% at least. So 40% of the money of the fund needs to be used for the adaptation and mitigation of climate change. I think that we are going to achieve this in the Parliament and that is important. But then there is a more important uh, debate there. What sort of, of accounting is going to be set up? I want to explain this to you because this has been one of the biggest fights that we have had these days. How do we calculate what is an investment and what isn't an investment that can be included in that 40%? Well, we have a regulation, a European regulation, the taxonomy regulation that explains that an investment in um, nuclear energy is not green, that gas is not green, it is fossil fuel, so it limits the use of gas. And thus, this regulation that is very, very important and that the political party PP hates, um, they don't want, the PP does not want for that 40% to be referred to that regulation because then they will not be able to spend that money in, for instance, um, doing gas pipelines or helping coal mines and financing nuclear energy. So this has been a brutal fight that I believe are, we're going to win and that 40% will be referred to the taxonomy. And that is a great piece of news if we manage to do that. The other topic is that we want for the rest of the investment, not, the, not that 40, but the rest, we apply something that is called the principle of not... Uh, damaging significantly the uh, environmental objectives. This is a legal principle of the EU. The PP did not want that either. And what does that mean? That the other 60 percent, you cannot spend. You may not spend it on activities set up by the taxonomy, but you cannot spend it in activities that will effectively harm the environment and our fight against climate change. And that was a very important part as well. And I think that we will also manage to win that fight. So from that point of view, green matters seem to be good. That is the parliament position, but then we have to negotiate it with the council. But these green matters are going to be well reflected, and that was very important because we had a very important risk and we were running there because 750 billion euros in the next four year, uh, years in Europe, if this is not aligned with a Green New Deal, with a, the with a European Green Deal, then forget about the Green Deal because we will never achieve um, neutrality in 2050 and we will not reduce 60% by 2030. So that instrument was very important and needed to contribute to our fight against climate change. So it was a very hard fight, but I think we're... Um, we are in the right direction. We have another debate tomorrow, we'll see how it ends. And something else we didn't want that was also a very hard fight was that the uh, European Commission, and I'm sorry for the way I am talking, that they use this fund to stick their foot where they shouldn't, because the ECFIN civil servants sometimes love to, to um, 
to get their head in rooms where they're not invited. And some bureaucrats of the commissions wanted to benefit from this so that they could have a say in things where they shouldn't. They wanted to reform the labor market or reforms that had to do with the pension funds and so on by linking it with the European semester. I'm not going to take much time on that. But we have that fight and it's still there. And what we're saying is that the regulation that we're going to pass has some very specific objectives with regards to digital and green and so on, the Parliament is going to include a, posit, uh, a social component that is very positive, but we didn't want it to be linked to the semester that would allow the Commission to come to Spain and say, well, but the labour market, since you are getting some of our fund, I'm going to tell you how you have to do this or that, because some Euro MPs, uh, Spanish Euro MPs, liberal and right-hand side really wanted for that to happen. I think that will not, um, they will not win there either. And then we had another fight, a very, very, another fight with regards to, to the macroeconomic conditionality. If you're going to link that fund to fulfilling the tax norms, and that's something that the right wanted to happen. What does that mean? Well, it means that Right now, as you know, the Stability and Growth Pact has been suspended until next year. That is what allows Spain to have two-digit deficits without having an infraction procedure started. That is great news, and it is a historic uh, agreement in Europe. This, this, this agreement has been suspended, and we had to do it because we are at a level of debt and deficit that is very high because we needed to face the pandemic, and it's normal. But some people wanted for next year, not for next year, but for the next year, for the general clause of the the escape clause in the pact to be once again enforced and that there would be a very strong conditionality. If you could not start respecting the deficit path that the Commission would set, they could suspend the funds from the recovery fund for you. And that will be a very hard battle in the trilogue, but in the Parliament we will be able to, to win that. So we will use the position of the Parliament to be stronger in the trilogue. And I think it's important for some other reasons, because we are at a moment, and Natalia might be able to talk about it as well, of uh, rethinking what the great uh, dogmas of the economic policies have been. Not just because of what the bank has done, but because the stability pact being suspended is something very relevant. And now the Commission and even the Commissioner of Economy is saying that the pact cannot go back to being what it was. And that is great news. I think that if we can start reviewing those dogmas of the limit of the 3% deficit and the output gap and structural balance and all of these variables that are, that are impossible to respect to establish tax consolidation of countries, I think that would be a very good piece of news. So trying to, to land this topic, I'm going to say that the regulation we needs to be green. I haven't said it, but it's very important. We are also going to add having gender impact evaluations in national plans so that we take into account what are the measures that are going to be put in place and what their impact in gender equality will be. And that's very important because anti-cyclic uh, politics never had um, any consideration traditionally for the impact that they had in gender equality. For instance, I always put the same example, Zapatero, uh, when he was our president, he did an investment plan, it was all for public works and that is an activity that we all know that is intensely um, masculine labor where no women work. So when you do a plan such as this one, you have to also see how you maintain salaries and income not just for men but also for women and that will be included in the regulation and I'm very happy for that because it was very important for us. So I will just end by saying that we will see this regulation, we hope to finish it in November. I think it will have a nice green color. It will be good for the environment and also for social elements. And I think that from that standpoint, it is a very good opportunity for Spain, as Natalia was saying previously. We also were very lucky, I want to say this, because the regulation is going to be piloted by a progressive um, government who has really shown their willfulness and their, their will to reduce inequalities and, and, and problems we had in the last few years and for the environment. And I wanted to end with something that Natalia also said, with the willfulness of um, diversifying 
economic sectors, and that is a very important challenge that we have. Because something that I that I found shameless was the way in which the Juncker's plan was executed in Spain, because the, all the big companies in Spain got the Juncker's plan, and I think that that is what we need to avoid with the fund, and that was what Natalia mentioned. So I'm going to stop talking now, because I think I talked for, for too long. I hope it was interesting, and I'm sure that there will be lots of questions, and we will be able to answer them all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ernest. Yes, it was very, very interesting. Everything that you have told us, telling us what happens behind closed doors, and you know all of those, all of those things that happen in the EU, those regulations that are not under, uh, that 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 are not the protagonists, but are in the end the key to everything else and to how things are done and how funds are being distributed. So this is what in the end surprises us. So let's see if in the end we have the results that you mentioned. You have explained very well everything that has to do with the fund and to how it's structured and the possible uses for the fund that they have to go to climate change. You, you talked about the taxonomy and that they shouldn't harm the environment, that that is very, very important because obviously we are seeing in these last few months that the immediate response to the crisis in certain cities and regions is to clearly uh, start building again. So they're betting on bricks and getting out of the crisis by speculating and building and eliminating uh, environmental barriers to, to make uh, these projects faster in the name of the job creation. So, so that is very, very important. And we also have talked about the fact that the response to this crisis has not just been a response from the monetary policies through the European Central Bank, but they also have been political tax policies. We have suspended the economic dogmas of um, austerity and neoliberalism that had been that have brought us to. Um, a situation of worsening of our economy in 2008 with the, the great crisis of 2008 till 2013 until those, uh, those effects were reduced. But we are in a situation of risk, as you said. And actually the Bank of Spain and other bodies have said, well, yes, that's very good, but in 2021 and 2022 we can spend, but then afterwards we have to stop stop spending and we have to start once again with the adjustment of the deficit by reducing our expenses. So once again we face the, the danger of austerity policies to raise their heads once again. So I don't know if we are really seeing how important this is. And I wanted to ask you now to talk about other aspects. We know of the importance of green taxes to uh, go hand in hand with these transition processes and this ecologic transition by sending signs, um, by incentivizing and by de-incentivizing also certain, certain policies, certain activities, certain economies, certain investments, certain productive production models. But we also have seen, um, although it didn't surprise us, it did worry us to see that when the general budget of the state has been presented by this government, the only thing that has been debated on is the moderated increase of diesel prices, which is just taking the difference of negative taxes that it had when compared to, to gas oil. So they're not reverting it completely, they're simply improving it a bit. And this has started a whole battle, not just amongst the right, in Ciudadanos, but also amongst the PNV, that's a partner of the government. That was the only topic, up till now, that was the only topic that has started up the debate. So going back to taxes and green taxes, that really worries me. We know that Spain is one of the European countries that has less green uh, taxes, and that less green taxes has, and we know that in general terms, our country has a seven-point deficit with regards to GDP 
and a tax collection when compared to the rest of the EU. And now that we have seen the general budget for the state, we see that there is a moderate increase of certain taxes, so certain tax rates, but it is not sufficient to be in the right journey to reduce this tax deficit when compared to the rest of Europe. And especially with regards to green taxes. So what, what do you think about this? How do you think we should act? Do you think it is the time, the right time, to respond with a, a more aggressive tax policies with regards to tax collections? Or do you think we have to wait for the economy to be a bit stronger? What do you think about taxes, green taxes? Where should we act upon? What aspects should we consider to develop new tax rates and have new green taxes or increase the current green taxes. So tell us, tell us about um, these taxes, green taxes. And I also wanted to ask you as well about the fact that big company groups in this country, big construction companies have been really working to be the first ones to, to, to be at the head of, of this effort to create infrastructures. Because under the, the umbrella of infrastructures, there are lots of different things. There is, for instance, um, water treatment plants or even highways. So how do you see this with regards to the dangers in infrastructures? What infrastructure should be covered by this fund and what infrastructure shouldn't. Tell us what would be the priorities in this ecologic transition, because except for energy that has already been mentioned, and it's a clear case, what other sectorial policies do you think should be helped by these funds in order to make this transition a more agile transition, since they necessarily have to tackle that? Thank you. Yes, Natalia, please. Yes, one and the other, one and the other. Oh, you have uh, talked about many. You have talked about many different topics, very important topics. I would um, say, with regards to green taxes, and with regards to the fact that the uh, tax to diesel has has uh, seems to have been erased from the budget. I am convinced of the potential of the green taxes in consumption decisions, investment decisions, research and development decisions by companies. We have seen it in the electric sector, for instance, where the price of, uh, of carbon with regards to emissions, and not just in Spain, but in every country in Europe has really gotten the coal out of the, car of the mix, of the energy mix. And that has allowed for a greater, uh, a greater production of electricity with gas instead of coal. And mainly that was due to the fact that we set up a tax for coal. It has created that disadvantage between the one and the other. Obviously, we cannot leave it at that. I completely agree with Ernest that gas is also a fossil fuel that generates less emissions than, than coal, than burning coal but it's also fossil fuel and we mustn't forget that and obviously it should not receive recovery funds. So I, can, I am convinced of the power of taxes, of subsidies and uh, fiscality in general to uh, guide consumption decisions and investments. Now as for diesel, regardless of the amount, I have not calculated what it meant with regards to tax collection, collection, I think it is a lost opportunity because I think that although I mean I could, I although I think that the elasticity and not having changed the the diesel consumption is not so high, so we would not have managed to reduce the number of miles that are being uh, covered with diesel vehicles. We would have had a very low impact on the composition of the fleet of vehicles and. I don't know, I don't know. But what I do think is that the power of messages is important. If the message we send is we are decided to start this transition, this ecologic transition with the help of green taxes, then let's do it. 
but we can't at our first try say okay where we thought there should be a tax to at least have the same taxes for diesel and gasoline then we will withdraw it and what's the problem um, behind this well it's the fact and the fact that this is not the first chapter we also saw that previously with taxes to fossil fuels were behind the the triggering of the uh, yellow yellow vests in France and others we mustn't forget that taxes have to go hand in hand with other measures other compensations because although I do agree that we have to have a fiscality for fossil fuels we also have to take into account that certain collectives certain people cannot cannot avoid for that tax to to have an impact on them for instance people who cannot change their vehicle they already have a diesel they cannot use public transportation because they live in uh, further places so when we adopt a measure whether it's tax or whether it is a closing carbon uh, coal plants or nuclear stations then it has to go hand in hand with other measures measures to compensate the situation so that those losers will not oppose to the change so that the pnv will not be against that measure or that ciudadanos will not uh, not go against that tax so that they are not opposed to that tax being part of the general budget compensating comp compensatory measures that have to be designed so that they do not lose that incentivating um, element for instance giving all citizens a check for the amount that will be collected at equal parts for that for that new tax that new diesel uh, tax so that the citizens see that tax um, uh, green taxes have benefits because money is being collected and so that they make the the link between what they pay for diesel and the benefits that they get with that check. So we have to think about taxes, but we mustn't just think about the taxes and subsidies. We also have to think about compensa compensations. Vale, quizá por añadir... Okay, I could maybe add that... Bueno, hay, hay un gran debate sobre la well, there is a great debate about the reform of of taxes in general in Europe and um, environmental taxes. Taxes in general, because it is still one of the great uh, rain problems we have with uh, tax havens and with regards to taxation competency of the different um, the different companies, for instance, uh, corporate corporate taxes. There are measures that we have not been able to fight for, for instance, organizing. Uh, a common basis for uh, company taxes so that there are not a certain company a certain countries that become tax havens with their deductions and so on so taxation is still one of the topics where we have to improve the situation we have an internal market that is very integrated and we have 27 different taxation jurisdictions that compete against each other and it's a great disaster and it is one of our greatest challenges for the next few years having said that making progress towards new tax figures that will allow for us to collect money but that will also allow for us to modify certain 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 activities and certain decisions is advancing and there is now a debate with regards to the new uh, resources out of those 750 billion in debt that we're going to issue the member states in july were not in agreement with regards to how to repay that and that is a topic that is not known by everyone, but we don't know how that debt is going to be repaid. It has not been decided. And there, there's a worry there, because if we do not make a decision about the new resources of the Union, because we are the ones who have to repay that debt, it will have to be the budget that will repay it. And in the long term, it could uh, create cuts in the Union programs that would be amazing, and we have to avoid that. So there is a debate about new resources of the union and those amongst those new resources environmental taxes will have a very important role what we are currently debating are new figures such as the um, european tax to plastic that would be a great piece of news we're also talking about a tax 
to uh, kerosene of planes and the right does not want us to talk about that not even talk about it uh, but you know that uh, the you know that airspace airspace industry does not pay any taxes for for the uh, kerosene that they use and that was a measure that was put in place to allow for the for the for the development of this sector but now that we know that we need to reduce the air traffic within the EU uh, we need an a tax to kerosene that would be very important and that is blocked that is blocked the tax to plastic is not as blocked as the kerosene tax debate and another topic that is on the table is a tax for coal in the borders and this is something that is going to be approved i think it will be seen by all of us and it's the fact that products that have been um, manufactured outside of the EU that have been produced with high coal intensity will have to pay for um, an entrance uh, tax and that is on the table and we will see some examples of, of that sort and they will have a very important role in the repayment of this recovery fund. I think that this is something that is well thought of. We're going to issue debt and the repayment will be um, achieved with some new taxes and some of those taxes need to be linked to the environment. So we haven't won this battle because these new uh, resources have not been decided. No one has decided how this debt is going to be repaid. But I think that we are opening the way to that road and that's what we need to fight. Ernest, I think, Fernando, if you, if you don't mind, I have a question. I would think it would be the greatest news to, to have that tax uh, call at the customs, at the border. I think it would be something that would help other countries to also be a part of this, of this tax on coal because I, that would that would somehow allow them not to pay for that for those custom fees when they export to europe i think that that would somehow allow for the, the for for a fight um, against this delocalization so i think it would be really positive but i have doubts and that is why i'm going i'm asking you this question because it's not a field that i understand or that i know from what point um, from the point of view of international relations, is it something really feasible? Because I'm, I'm scared of the fact that if the EU really fights for this, uh, custom, this custom fee for coal at the border and, and we set it up, could this trigger um, sanctions, uh, commercial sanctions or custom fees wars? Because maybe that threat could be the one that would prevent us from adopting this tax. Well, 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 we have a bad precedent with this, which is the digital tax. The digital tax that should have been introduced a long time ago since uh, Trump thr uh, threatened us with, with a commercial war, we haven't, uh, we haven't included it. And this is a problem. And I, and I think that it's always better to develop this in the G20 when you adopt these decisions in the G20 because this is something that they are waiting for. I mean, they're all waiting for Trump to lose the election so that we can reactivate this in the G20 and so that we can do it together with all the big economies, this digital tax. So the uh, tax of coal at the borders should also be something that we could agree upon in a multilateral framework. Since the UN um, is not doing anything, we have to do it at the G20. That's how we have done it in the last few years. But it's a risk. But I think that the EU also has to risk things. We have to be brave. And I think that there is a risk of this getting a harsh response, um, commercial war against the EU. But the EU also has a strong position because in the end, the 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 market, the European market, is the main market. Everyone wants to come and uh, sell here. So, oh, so starting a war against the EU is not easy either. So that's why when, when we talk about what interest do we have in having integrated instruments at the EU, well, in any case, if that tax exists individually, in the con um, we could not do it as a country. We either do it as, the, as Europe or we cannot do it. So I think that, well... The digital tax indicates that those dangers are there because we actually decided not to do it because of the threat that Trump issued. 
But I think that the parliament at least has to to fight so that the, the EU is braver and risks it. Because the EU in environmental issues should, should be the one that sets the, the thresholds and the, the, and the policies. So that tax could then be copied by other economies, this, this call. But yes, it's a very relevant question, the one you asked me. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I have been listening to some of the questions that have been asked um, in the chat, those people who are following on the debate. And some have to do, well, some, some of the questions are for you, Ernest. How can we guarantee that the resources will be sent to where they should be sent and so that we do not misspend the monies and we don't um, fall into the traps that you have been mentioning? Is it guaranteed with the regulations that are going to be established and who would be the supervisor to, to make sure that the investments that did not fulfill the, the requirements and that did not meet the targets or, or goals should be paid back or should be cancelled? That's one of the worries. And the other uh, question for, for Natalia has to do with the fact that um, energy transition is all very well and fine and promoting renewable energies and end with fossil fuels, but you have not said anything about the need to reduce consumption and have a degrowth in energy consumption. How do you see that? What part of the problem solution has to do with efficiency and saving degrowth? of our um, energy consumption. And I also wanted to ask you, because it has been mentioned very often that we have to choose hydrogen as the great solution, a great potential, a great industrial technological development. How do you see it, both of you, Natalia and Ernest? And, and take into account that we only have 15 minutes left. So, so try and an answer, but taking into account that we only have 15 minutes for the both of you. If that's all right, Ernest, tell us how, how uh, Europe is going to make sure that the funds are well uh, used. I didn't say it, but in the regulation we are trying to improve that. We are trying to set up lots of expenditure uh, control mechanisms and I think that that is really worth it and actually that is quite cross-cutting all the political parties I agree with that uh, measures against the corruption and fraud and expenditure control mechanisms we are giving uh, taxation authorities to the OLAF the anti-fraud um, office so that they have more competences with regards to controlling controlling expenses and OLAF works very well. They have uncovered lots of frauds in the use of European monies and we're going to empower them in the regulation. That is the first measure. Now, the Commission is also going to be very vigilant with regards to uh, the, the plan's objectives being respected. So with regards to the semester reform part, we don't really like it. That is why we tried for that to be weaker in the regulation. But then there are other parts where we want the Commission to be very vigilant and more specifically, for instance, with regards to the execution of that 40% that has to be destined to biodiversity and climate. And if the taxonomy is the reference, we're going to ask the Commission and we at the Parliament are going to be very vigilant as well. We're going to ask the Commission to be um, all ears and all eyes so that the taxonomy is fully respected. We will include that in the regulation so no one can even think about if we manage to include the taxonomy and I'm sure we will do it. No one will even think about uh, financing a gas structure because many countries want to use the money for that. That is just a reality. That's what they want the money for. So those mechanisms against fraud and so that the money is well spent, we, we are trying to reinforce them. And I think that that will very, be very important. But I also wanted to say something about that. It is also going to be very important to have national controls because the discretionality of the government is going to be very, very high. And the Commission is going to control this and it will be important. But, we, but also in Spain, I think it's important to demand from our government, to our government, at least to my government, it's my government, we will demand from them to be uh, very 
very strict in the execution. So I don't know if it has been foreseen, but there should be a mechanism for the control of expenses of the European funds that will take place here in Spain. I mean, it would be a very good idea. I'm sorry, but we are... I think that Ernest has lost connection. We cannot hear him. He is frozen. So different kinds of producing hydrogen. I'm sorry, once again, he's frozen. I understand that it can be a non-polluting activity and a strategy on green um, hydrogen for Spain that could be very interesting, but I will let Natalia talk about this because I don't want to talk about topics where I'm no expert. Okay. I wanted, first of all, to talk about the topic of degrowth. I think that what we have to do is grow better. We have to to have a technological change that will allow us to keep on producing, but that production should not generate emission of uh, greenhouse gas effects. I think that the pandemic has shown how costly it is from an economic and social point of view to degrow. How much should we degrow for without changing our technology that degrowth would uh, tr turn into an enough reduction of emissions to be on the right track of not uh, not heating up the planet and not emitting too many um, CO2 um, or greenhouse gas effect gases. I think that degrowth is not the solution and it would bring costs that we would not be willing to to face and the first thing that we would have against us would be the reaction of society because growth is, re is resources, is um, activity, is jobs, is what we live off on a daily basis and society will not want to fight against climate change if that uh, causes degrowth and thus a loss of wealth. But we don't have to degrow to have an, an economic activity that is compatible with the fight against climate change. What we need to do is to grow better. We have to invest in efficiency, in energy efficiency, of course. But when we invest in efficiency, in energy efficiency, all of that investment is not translated into saving and reducing emissions. Because if we're capable of being more efficient from an energy standpoint, it also means that the energy cost is lower. And when the cost of something is lower, its demand increases. So there is a rebound effect and it will not neutralize all of the investment in energy efficiency, but it does mitigate that, that um, initial savings. So energy efficiency can be good, although it might um, mitigate the effect of emissions. Of course it is, but we mustn't think that if we save 100% of that investment, it will in the end turn into a reduction of emissions. I think, and you were asking us, Fernando, at the beginning, during one of your first interventions, that one of the strategic um, things we need to do to, to have economic growth and to have a better ecological transition is to invest in R&D. And the limits of current technologies are um, unsurmountable. The only thing that will allow us to make progress is to have research because it will allow us to identify materials that are uh, less costly but that are more efficient from an energy point of view or that allow us to store, store more gas or that can um, reduce losses. So we really have to uh, bet on R&D and I am saying this as a researcher, I think that that has multiplying effects that are very powerful. I think that in Spain there is lots of talent. We have people that are really willing to put in place projects that could be very innovative and they cannot do it because they do not have access to, to funds or to investment. And that goes hand in hand with a question that you asked about hydrogen. Hydrogen is a technology that will allow for the storage of energy and its direct use in certain um, industrial processes for which electricity is not, is not feasible. So we will have to generate um, en electricity with renewable energies, but if we don't have access to those renewable energies, then hydrogen could be an alternative decarbonization uh, path. I, it's very interesting. I am not a technologist, so I cannot uh, really assess the, the 
whether the current maturity of the technology is enough or what are the skills that we currently have in Spain if we are in an ideal position. But I do think it is very interesting to, to start thinking about certain strategic lines and to adopt as a, as a strategy for the country. In order to develop hydrogen, I insist we need R&D, we need research and development. And I think that both are complementary. Well, about hydrogen, Fernando, if you'll allow me, I just wanted to say that something that is worth mentioning without being an expert, as Natalia was saying, there are activities where electrification is not possible and hydrogen does offer a solution. One of those uh, situations is the um, aerospace sector, for instance, electricity in planes is very complicated and Airbus is currently um, working on the development of a hydrogen commercial plane for 2030. So I don't know if that is a possibility, but we have to find an alternative for the airspace industry because it is a, an important problem. And that is why the taxing kerosene is so important, because if we tax kerosene, then other companies will also find or look for alternatives. And that is what really um, triggers that whole process, that technological process. So taxes don't just affect consumption, they also affect the incentives and the way in which companies try and find alternatives, uh, ways of providing the same service. And I think that the aerospace sector, as Ernest was saying, is one of the most polluting sectors and they have not been limited enough. And I think that tax and kerosene would be a catalyst of R&D to find alternatives and as Ernest was saying hydrogen could be one of those uh, alternatives. Pepe Larios is telling us in the chat that that no way that hydrogen is very bad so I see that there is lots of debate in that sense. Yes, yes it's true. Hydrogen is, is part of a very hot debate and degrowth as well. I know that my position is that we need to degrow a lot in unsustainable activities and grow in sustainable um, activities. We need to find that balance. I don't know what the balance, the final balance would be in GDP, but I know what the balance would be in terms of job creation that will be very positive for the creation of jobs and for the health of the planet and all of us and of the economy in general. So since we don't have much time, Natalia, um, you said that Well, we wanted to talk about one topic and it is actually quite relevant because it has to do with all the doubts that, that we have. We have the policies that we have, we have the state that we have, which is a state, a plural state, and that has different levels of, uh, of competencies, jurisdictions and administration. So in Spain, we have heard our president of the government say that the distribution of the funds will also have a component, um, a territorial component, and that the regions are going to manage 50% of the funds. And Ernest was saying that, uh, who, uh, that things have to be done as they should be done, and funds will not be sent to activities that are not the ones that we agreed upon. And states have a fundamental role in the control of how the money is spent. And we see that the presidency has created an office that will uh, be directly linked to the presidency and the Ministry of the Economy about the role of the regions in this, the way we spend these funds. How do you think this will work, Natalia? What do you think about this system that the government is setting up to distribute the funds and for the control of the said funds? so that we do not misspend the money and so that this is not inefficient and so that it is relevant to the objectives that the EU sets up. And then, lastly, I would like for, for both of you to have a couple minutes to just give us some general idea about what it is that we are that we are risking um, in Spain and in the EU with this green transition, with the policies and the resources that we have, what would happen if this failed? What would happen if this were not done? If our country did not really benefit from this opportunity that we have, what would be the consequences? Well, Fernando, I have to apologize because 
I really don't know what would be the final design of the governance of the plant, but I can tell you some idea. I can share some ideas with you with regards to that. I don't think it's bad that part of the, the money is distributed close to where the investments are taking place, but I think that the state needs to have a central role and they have to follow up on the management and, and in the mechanisms of allocation and so on. And it is so much the case that I would say that the decision should not be for the national states, but even the, the EU should be the one deciding if we want to, to invest in renewable energies instead of allocating money to each of the countries or to each of the regions because it would be simply an allocation with different criteria than the ones that are going to be applied to decide how the investments are going to be done. Then we should say in Europe we want to, to have a thousand megas of solar energy. Where could we do uh, that investment? Well, obviously it will be Spain, it would be Italy, Greece, the southern countries. If we do a distribution by national quotas, then we will maybe um, violating the principle of where it would be best to do those investments because maybe solar in Spain, Italy and Greece but maybe uh, hydraulic would be in Denmark and in Germany so there are uh, reasons why the allocation should be done at the highest level so that it is more efficient obviously there should be some mechanisms to create some equality amongst the different territories, but we would, but applied to the Spanish case, I think that the decision, the decision of the lines and the projects where we need to invest, should be at a at a higher level, at the level of the central state, regardless of the fact that there will be more investment in recycling in certain regions. In other regions, there will be more investment in factories for the manufacturing of e, um, electric vehicles. And if that allocation is being done before the definition of the projects, and then we will distort the, the correct allocation of those funds. And let me just be a bit more precise with regards to the hydrogen. Because I linked it to one of the ideas that I said at the beginning that has to do with complementing reforms and interventions. And I think the hydrogen um, is an important thing. We can invest in hydrogen, but if we do not change the regulation of electricity so that hydrogen can benefit from the low costs of producing renewable energies, then it's not uh, worth it to reduce um, the cost to produce hydrogen if we do not make sure that the low cost of producing electricity with the renewable energies also will benefit hydrogen. Because you know that with electrolysis uh, we are creating hydrogen, so hydrogen requires electricity for its uh, production. So yes, investing in hydrogen, yes, but with reforms on electric regulation that would allow for those lesser costs that would then have an impact on prices. Well, with regards to the management of funds in Spain, well, I think that the government wants to share the management of the funds. There were recently there was recently a conference of uh, autonomic presidents uh, where we said that we want to involve the regions and obviously it makes sense. I mean, the, uh, there's only going to be one treasury um, and it will all go through the general budgets of the state, but it does make sense to have a co-governance in a country that is so decentralized as ours. If one of the programs is going to be the digitization of the administration, because it's very important, as a civil servant I have felt the delays that we have in that sense when I worked for the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. But I think that the administrations, uh, local administrations also require this. So I think that this collaboration is going to be much needed. And then there is another topic we're insisting on, which is the participation of uh, city councils. Uh, part of the fund is linked to climate change and it will have to come from renewing um, uh, buildings, mobility and so on. That will be an important part of the fund and city councils have to have an important role in that sense and they have sent us 
um, letter to the negotiators of the fund, to all the groups, but also to the president of the commission, the town, uh, the mayor of Barcelona, of Paris, of Milan, of Budapest, of Warsaw, asking us to have a direct management of part of the fund, and I actually support that. That will be an important part. And then, for uh, to answer to your last question, Fernando, we are risking many things here. So this operation needs to be successful due to many reasons. First of all, because the first um, big project of a common debt to make transfers to to different member states needs to be a success because otherwise those of us who have been fighting for eurobonds for integration of not just the single market but also political tools fiscality uh, taxation and so on this is a great uh, step forward and if it does not if it does not turn out to be successful then it will be explode in our faces so this needs to be the embryo of a real European Union with capacity, with investment capacity. And then from a Spanish standpoint, obviously, we are risking our, the transition of our productive model that we require. We cannot keep on paying the electricity bill that we are paying because we are dependent on, on other countries. We cannot just depend on tourism because that's why our economy is, so, is suffering so much. I mean, tourism is a sector that is suffering a lot and we need to give them our support and they always tell me that when we have debates. I know that's true, it requires help, but we cannot live just of tourism, the percentage of tourism and our GDP cannot be that high. We need to develop um, leading industries in energy or in the case of Barcelona, for instance, which is the case that I know, health, biomedicine. We have lots of possibilities of, of really launching sectors that are in a, in a transition process or that could be leading sectors. We haven't talked about that, but we need to really win the race of, uh, of um, of electric vehicles, that is very important for our country, cars. I know that we environmentalists have a very complicated relationship with with the automotive industry, but there are lots of jobs in that in that sector, and it is a sector that we have to push towards electrification. So we have to win this race, the EV race, from an industrial standpoint. That's very important because if we do not win this race, and the electric vehicles are manufactured somewhere else, we are going to really suffer from a job standpoint, job creation standpoint, and with regards to production. So that race needs to be won, and, and these funds could be useful in that sense. So, so we, we really are risking lots of things. So those are the two things that I would say. We have to continue with that new idea of Europe that we're starting to imagine, and then the transition of our productive model that we need in Spain. So I would like to say, to finish, that I completely agree with everything that Ernest has said, so I'm not going to repeat it. I will simply be a bit more dramatic. I think that we are playing this match point. We, we, are, we are fighting against the, um, the dominance of the extreme right in Europe. If we do not have a successful result, then the extreme right will win. Austerity brought poverty, it brought inequality, and it brought extreme right. And I think that if this project, this European project fails, then once again we will be giving wings to that extreme right, and they would be in, this, in the institutions, and they would end with this project. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia and Ernest. It was a very interesting debate. You were... There, you had very interesting interventions, extraordinary interventions, and uh, we have run out of time. We talked for six more minutes than expected. I wanted to thank the Foundation Transición Verde, the uh, Green European Foundation, and La Casa Encendida for organizing these sessions. And I, I think that we have to congratulate them for the success because of the number of participants that we had in each of the sessions, but and also because of the level of the participants and the importance and depth of the topics that were, that were dealt with. So we are not going to close the, the sessions with this because we are going to organize more debates actually on November 5th 
the Foundation Transition Verde is going to organize a debate on transformative cities, cities of the future. On November 19th, we will have another session on fair transition. And on December 3rd, we will have one on the touristic model that we currently have in Spain that cannot have the GDP weight it has. So that keeps us submitted to the risks that um, a pandemic such as this one entails with, um, with tourism going down. So thank you once again, Natalia and Ernest. And we invite you all to be present during the next activities that the Foundation Transición Verde is organizing. You will find all the information in our website, transicionverde.es. And well, I wanted to thank you for being here, for participating. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that this recovery fund for ecologic transition of our economy is a great success so that Spain can really face its present and future challenges much better than it has done up till now. <laughs>